Welcome everybody to Haven of Horror. We're back. We had a couple of mishaps with the previous videos, but we're back for real this time. Uh, brought my friend uh, back. Do you have an online name that you want me to call you? Okay, my friend Sarah is back with us. She's going to be on the channel more regularly, I hope. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing the Evil Dead video all those months ago. Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about Screen 2, which you just watched for the first time in years, right? Yes. Okay, so before we get into the actual movie discussion, I'm just curious because I missed most of your viewing of it. What did you think of the sequel to the 1996 film? It was pretty predictable. I mean, I like the first one a lot, but it's uh, it's very in tune to how the first one was laid out. So the only difference is instead of high school, it's now college. Mm -hmm. Really, but I liked it. It was entertaining. It's a good, a good slasher film to watch when you want to watch something scary. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, so I agree with you. It does mostly hit the same beats as the first one. But I think it does that on purpose because this is very much a satire of sequels in the way that Scream 1 is a satire of the slasher movie. And as anyone who's watched movies knows, the rules for sequels is they have to be bigger and better uh, than the first one. So a lot of those beats, I think, are, yeah, it's Scream, but bigger because it's in college. Um, yeah, for sure. Did you buy the villain reveal? No, not really. <laughs> really? Okay, interesting. So, okay, so I'm curious. What what about it didn't you buy? I don't know. Maybe I, I felt like the actual killer in this one wasn't seen as much in as it was in the first one. Like, the two involved in the first film that were responsible for the terror that they caused, they were in it quite frequently. Whereas this one, it took more of a subtle approach, I guess. Like, you were always on your toes. You always thought it was somebody within the friend group because that's what happened before. And this one, even though I've seen it, I vaguely remembered who the killer was. So, seeing it again, I was, like, on my toes the whole movie. And it was kind of like, wow, I forgot how intense this was. Especially towards the end when they're on the stage and multiple people pop up from, mm -hmm. you know, the movie and the friend group. And you're like, oh, is that the one? Is that the one? But no. So you think <laughs> it plays. OK, so let me just just make sure I understand. So you think maybe it spends too much time trying to introduce red herrings and not enough time putting the main the, who the killers actually are in the thing. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um, so we we will come back to that. Uh, I just wanted to get kind of your first impressions. So obviously this movie starts in a movie theater showing Stab, which becomes the movie within a movie in this franchise. I really like that idea, and I like the way they set up the, the opening as kind of a bigger version of the first movie's opening. Uh, I know you don't like Jada Plinkett Smith, who is in the beginning... Was it kind of satisfying to see her get uh, murdered on screen? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, and then I don't know if you recognized him, but her boyfriend in that scene is in House. Yes, I did recognize him. A younger version of <laughs> himself, for sure. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Can you believe this came out a year after the first movie? Yeah, I actually, when I was doing some number um, number research just on, like, budget and everything, it, it was the, the only film to be released so soon after the original. So, um, you know, sequels usually have, like, a, a year or two gap in between them. This one was released in 97, so it came well, out really quick. Well, and, I mean, that's kind of the slasher thing. If you look at, like, say, Friday the 13th, I think those first seven uh, all come out, you know, year after year, uh, mm -hmm. which is insane. But it's because, you know, you've got the form, you've got the lay basic layout. You just shoot it and ship it, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like <laughs> the budget 
I don't know what the budget was for the first original film, but the uh, budget for Screen 2 was $24 million, and I didn't convert that to today's money, but I felt like the production value was way better on this movie. Mm -hmm. So, just for reference, the budget for the first one was 14 to $15 million. Okay. Um, and then... And that's that's decently high for a slasher, uh, and then the budget for this one is twenty four million, which is in, I would say, really high for a slasher. Typically, slashers are in the low millions, um, just because yeah. it's not like a big production, like. Um, yeah, they usually, you know, from my expertise of watching these types of films they're usually all centered in one area mm -hmm. you know like for example the evil dead they're all in like minus the third one but both of the first and second one are in the cabin the whole mm -hmm. time the production doesn't need to be extravagant whereas in this one it was in a movie theater it was at the college it was at the production in the theater at the college the audio room, you know, there's a lot of detail that needed to be shown. Mm -hmm. They did a good job, too. I I felt like, um, and I mentioned this to you, too. I didn't know what the play was that they were portraying in the movie. It kind mm -hmm. of gave me the Phantom of the Opera vibe, just because people die in that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like a play on that. Production value was really good. So, um, yeah, and um, a lot of that, especially in the first one, is they shoot on location. Uh, so, like, this one was made in Georgia and Los Angeles to represent Ohio. I don't know why you just don't shoot in Ohio, but whatever. Um, and they probably, <laughs> I'm looking here to see, because I've never actually thought to look into it. Um, but they probably did uh use like real a real college um yeah i know georgia is actually um a pretty popular area for filming uh the walking dead series is filmed in georgia a lot of marvel films there yeah oh here it is uh oh sorry go ahead oh no i was, i was just gonna say i think there's a studio there i think maybe tyler perry's studio so they used Agnes Scott College and USC UCLA. So yeah, like uh what kind of gives this movie and the first movie uh, a sense of authenticity is it's not like we built a college. It's we filmed at a college. Uh and I think that adds a great deal of, of realism to to any film, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um so right away with the opening, jumping back to where we were before we got a little off track. Uh, so this movie instantly shows you, yeah, we're a sequel, we're bigger, we're, you know, gorier with the first kill in the movie being a knife right through the ear. And it looks so painful. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, uh, my mind is also ruined because I've seen Scary Movie now and they parody that and it's awful. I hate those movies. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lie. For a long time, I thought scary, the first scary movie was Scream, just mm -hmm. because of how how much they parried in it. And then I was like, oh, well, Scream is also a parody at the same time. So, yeah. yeah um, I, I have a... To me. Yeah, I have a friend who I've been... Sh I was showing horror movies for a while, and she argued with me for months that she would not watch Scream because it was stupid. And I was like, no, Scream is awesome. And it turns out she was thinking of Scary Movie. So I told her she's no longer allowed to argue with me about movies because I know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, fun little... Scream is kind of stupid, though. <laughs> but it's it's a good stupid. <laughs> it's a funny stupid. But see, it, it's hard to call something like Scream stupid because a lot of the stupid stuff is satirical of the of the genre that it's satirizing. So technically it's actually really well written. Yeah, no it is. It is, but it is like in a I guess a colloquial 
saying it is kind of stupid because you have all these these notes of it parodying itself. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are like, well, that's kind of dumb. Why would you do that? <laughs> but in reality, it is a genius because it's hilarious and yeah. they're in on the joke, you know? And, and I feel like the, the brilliance was Scream. That maybe this one is lacking a little bit. Is yes, Scream is a satire of slasher movies, but you can also just enjoy Scream as a whodunit, even if you don't get all the meta references. Whereas this one, I think, maybe goes too far with the meta references, even though I appreciate those. Like, I love that scene where they're in the film class just, you know, talking films. Uh, although this film is deadly wrong about one thing Aliens is not better than Alien. I'm just saying. I can't I can't speak to that. I've never seen them. <laughs> what? You've never seen Alien? No. That's Sigourney Weaver, right? Yeah. Directed by yeah, Ridley I Scott? I know, I know who I know like the historical significance and the, the director. I can say that I know things about it. I've just never physically seen it. And maybe we I can start on the sci fi train next. <laughs> We're going to change that one of these days. We will do an episode on Alien. Mm. Um, so the opening I really like, um, but I would say I think Scream 1 still has the better opening uh, with Drew Barrymore and and the popcorn and the kill. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, that's iconic, so it's, it's almost not fair to compare them just because that scene is like horror perfection, horror comedy perfection. Yeah, and I think maybe they thought they couldn't, they couldn't top that mm-hmm. by making it a film in the film that you're watching the same thing happen to, I believe it was Heather Graham. So it's, it's funny to me that like Wes Craven had a, a really smart way of being like, oh, hey, you have a film in a film that's parodying what happened in the first one because we can't recreate that. You you are correct. That is Heather Graham. And I have to say, I think the biggest laughs this movie got out of me is the clips of Stab that it shows. Um, Luke Wilson playing Billy Loomis in that one scene is hysterical. (laughs) And then you've got, you know, Tori Spelling as uh, Cindy Prescott. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So good. Yeah. And it's funny because those were two big actors at that time. You had like 90210 that was on TV at the time. So it's just funny to me that they got the the cameos that they did for this movie. Oh, is that why they picked them? Okay. I've never seen well, 90210. Um, she, uh, Tori Spelling's in that show. I don't know if Luke Wilson. Um, I know he had a stint on that 70s show, but I think that... That, this that would have been after. That. Yeah. So that's that's like early mid two thousands. Um I will say if there is one issue I have with the opening, it's a story plot problem. So Oh no wait, you know what I just realized? I think it fixes itself. Because their names are uh related to the Woodsboro. It's like a message thing. That's right. I forgot about that. Okay. Um and then we, we instantly jump over to Sydney. Kind of checking in on her, and I don't know. I don't know about you, but Sydney Prescott is just one of those characters. Like even in a bad movie, I like watching because Nev Campbell is so good in this role. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say Sydney is probably the best final girl, if not one of the best mm-hmm. uh, oh, final yeah. girls. She's very charming, and I feel like that's a weird thing to say for a, like a slasher film, <laughs> like the main character being very charming i don't know she's i like to watch her in these movies yeah and she's she's got a vulnerable side uh Mm -hmm. to her that i think a lot of final girls need too many too many movies i think the problem is that they try to make like a strong female character by giving her no weaknesses whereas this character very much has weakness but she's strong enough to overcome it yeah and and I feel like in every film, I haven't seen four, and I've not seen the new one. And three is a little big to me. But so far, one and two, 
he's getting more confident mm -hmm. and like more badass basically mm -hmm. which i appreciate for giving him more character he's not just a or woe is me female character in this film franchise so yeah exactly and then with with this being her in college Another nice thing about that is they can use the classes and the school as an excuse to have those meta references, uh, like that that film scene, film class scene that we talked about, um, where it's just an excuse to have a bunch of characters like, here's a movie reference, here's a movie reference, but they're also debating, I think, what the film is about kind of thematically, which is can a sequel be better than the original? I don't agree with some of the ones they named, like I stated. Uh, but I thought that might be an interesting subtopic here. Is there a sequel you think is better than the first? Oh, in any like any 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 genre? any genre. Oh gosh, man, I don't know. There's a lot of sequels <laughs> out there. Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Really? Well, okay, I have, so I really like the second Evil Dead, even though I know a lot of people don't really like that one, but only because, uh, like, the like in the very beginning of that movie, he's, like, going crazy, basically. Like, cabin fever type of, everything's talking to him, like, the clock's mocking him, stuff like that. In the first one, we didn't really get that, so... I like that, but I wouldn't say it's better than the first. Oh, I would. There's aspects of it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm I, I'm a true romantic and feel like originals are always better. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there are better sequels out there. My, like, that's a good question. My policy with The Evil Dead, because I, I do firmly believe that the second one is better. I respect the hell out of that first movie, and I love it. I like it quite a bit. But I think it needed that humor that he introduces in the second one. Um, so I would say it is better because it added that missing piece from the first movie. And you finally have a character in the second movie you can kind of like latch onto because as much as I love that first movie, all the main characters are kind of stale pieces of bread. Yeah. And <laughs> like the first film, too, you got to remember that was basically Sam Raimi's student film. Yeah. Like, yeah. They didn't really have a budget. They just kind of went into the woods and was like, okay, here you go. Here's our ideas. And then the second one, he got a lot more money. And I think he used that well. I he agree. Way more creative. Absolutely. Right. So anyway, but back to back to screen two. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do an Evil Dead video in the future. I've got, I've got ideas for that. Uh, I like that they mentioned Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Um, but I have to be honest, I thought that was like a mid 2000s, like internet invention. I did not realize it went back to like, no, I know it's real, but I, I didn't realize it went back to like the nineties. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. I feel like there's a funny story behind it. I don't know. That'd be, in that'd be interesting to look, uh, look into. Well, that, I personally have a few seven degrees of Kevin Bacon contacts so <laughs> it's it's like there's a theory behind it don't want to get boring and scientific but there is actually a theory um so the uh, the big thing with this movie with the with the main trio because that that's what it is you know it's the main trio uh is mm -hmm. every sequel has to reset gail and dewey uh so in this one he hates her again and she's kind of being a cold-hearted bitch and then they'll do it again in three. And then four doesn't do that exactly because they do have that long time skip. Because um, it was like 11 years between sequels at that point. Um, but as much as I, I love the, the, the two of those, like those two characters, because they work really well together. And one of the strengths of this movie, I think, is watching these two kind of try to unravel the plot, uh, which is basically the screen formula, right? Like, the killer's after Sydney and she's just trying to survive. And then those two go off and play like Scooby-Doo and try to try to figure out the plot. Um, how did you feel about them kind of resetting her character from the first movie? 
I'm not gonna lie. Um, her character and and Dewey's character are like the same to me in every yeah. you know every one of these movies I've seen, which isn't a bad thing. I think it's important to have stale characters in some of these films because if you have too many eclectic personalities, people are gonna get lost. And they're not going to know who to focus on or who to, like, be suspicious of. So mm-hmm. it's nice to have these characters that don't really have a, I don't know, I guess a character arc, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And they're, they, they're good comic reliefs. I don't know. He, um, what's his name? David Arquette. He's just really good at being that awkward guy that shows up at the worst time. So I like that for him. And that's Dewey. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I I can agree with that. I would say the problem is they they are for all intents and purposes uh, secondary protagonists. Um, so it would have been nice to see them maybe grow more. Other than uh, we're back to status quo of we're not together. We don't like each other. Dewey's mad at her for something. Um, but overall, I like the characters and I like watching them do their thing. So it doesn't bother me as much as maybe it should be. <clears throat> so speaking of actors in this film, movie, we talk, I messaged you about this when I was watching it earlier. Uh, as anybody knows, Buffy is a big part of this channel. And Sarah Michelle Gellar is in this movie. It's so weird to see her in this movie because I'm just so used to her as Buffy. And this would be the same year that Buffy debuted on TV. 97. Yeah, like, I feel like the mid-90s, the mid to late 90s were her years. Mm-hmm. Like, she was, like, the screen queen, basically. She was in all of those shows. Like, yeah. what, I know what you did last summer, and Cruel Intentions, and all of those movies. I still gotta see that. But, yeah, and then she it. dies, she dies in this, and in uh, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Um, yeah. Her is rough in this one like he just throws her out of the i think honestly it was refreshing as horrible as that sounds <laughs> like, we get enough of the stabby stabby i want to see somebody be thrown mm-hmm. like, off of a balcony or into a wood chipper i don't know be more creative about it well and and i like the character like the the murder the murder in these films but i like creative creative killing mm-hmm. Well, and one of the things with this movie being a slasher is because the killer isn't supposed to be like, he's not, you know, Freddy Krueger or Jason Voorhees. It's just a guy in a mask. Uh, So they don't get the opportunity to be as creative as something like Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th. But it is nice, you know, when they switch it up. I I do agree with you on that. Uh, Yeah. It's funny, too, since it's a parody of, like, all of these movies, you would have thought that Wes Craven would have taken inspiration from, like, Jason Voorhees, and, like, maybe this this character who's murdering people would have taken inspiration from a film like that, but have completely botched those types of, you know, ways well, that Jason Voorhees did these. So, there is an argument to be made that... Ghostface is paying homage because as much as this is a parody, it's also an homage to the franchise, like to those to those movies. Because it never says like, "Oh, these movies are bad." It's just this is what happens in a movie. You know this. What if we subvert that expectation? This is if there's an argument to be made that Ghostface is kind of homaging Michael Myers because Michael Myers is most well known for using a large butcher knife. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I got that, especially like in the very beginning of being stabbed in the ear. Like that gave me very much Jason vibes. Halloween is Michael why. Myers. Or yeah, give me vibes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, that, that was one guy in the mask. <laughs> yeah, they're all in masks, don't you know? Freddy's not. Could they be able to kill people? No, but he's he also has a distinctive. Look, Look yeah. yeah, he's very recognizable. So, since we're talking about Ghostface as a killer, um, the other thing that he shared the the thing that makes him unique is 
it's not Ghostface isn't a person almost so much as he's an idea, I guess, at this point. Because obviously there's a different ghost face in each film. But what really makes him iconic is that voice. Uh, Roger Stern, or sorry, Roger Jackson, uh, who who plays in all of them. And he was in the TV show, which I've never watched, other than the pilot. I didn't know there was a TV show. And it was an MTV thing. It looked pretty bad. Oh, oh that was a fever dream. I kind of remember that. <laughs> Uh, so obviously Roger Jackson is in all of them and he's consistently the best, like really good in, in all of them. Um, where do you kind of rank him and I guess the killer actors? Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to say he's number one, just because like, if you hear that voice, you don't think of, you know, the random one-off slasher film, you think of Scream or you visualize that mask with that voice even above robert england well yeah well okay so <laughs> I, that that franchise is before our time scream is definitely our generation mm -hmm. you know being 90s babies early 2000s like it, it's definitely more of what we grew up with mm -hmm. whereas you know robert england I didn't really grow up with his movies. He is iconic. Like, if I just see him, I know immediately he's Freddy. But when I hear the voice from Scream, I visualize that character. So okay. it's kind of got the opposite effects, you know? Like, they're both iconic because they both have trademarks. And you identify them. But I feel like Ghostface is more iconic. Because every, I mean... To your generation. Probably, yeah, to my or to generation. Or to our generation. Even this last... Halloween, I had like three of them show up at my front door. So <laughs> it's like people are still dressing up like that. I don't see any Freddies anymore, which is kind of sad. But yeah, you know, I'm I'm gonna use this as an excuse to go off on just a side tangent because I agree with you. Obviously, my generation grew up with Scream. I was Ghostface for Halloween one year. I think maybe it might have been me and you. We used to wear the mask to terrorize my cousin, um, <laughs> or that was some. I was me and somebody. But anyway. But I am very much like my movie taste. My favorite genre of film is 80 slashers, you know, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. And it really makes me sad that we've kind of moved on from, from that genre because I think there is a lot that hasn't been done with it. So I really hope between, you know, the new Halloween movies, we've got a new Scream movie. I'd like to see that stuff, you know, come back. I think it will. I do. Um you know, looking back at from what I can remember, I don't see anything that would be inherently problematic to reboot those franchises. And I, you know, we have people like Rob Zombie, who, in my opinion, is doing a fantastic job reliving his childhood through these films. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he does something with Freddy. I think it would be really cool. See, I, I'd like to see job. him do, I'd like to see him do Jason. Yeah. I think he'd be better he'd be suited better. for Jason. Honestly, I feel like he'd be great at anything because it seems like the man has absolutely no care in the world. He's like, I'm going to do what I wanted to happen back in the day. And I don't care what the studio says about it. Right. I'm going to do it. And he does, he does a great job. He's underrated, in my opinion. Remind me to talk to you about that after the show because I'd like to do some of his movies. Um, so the the other thing I really like with this being a sequel is our introduction to Sydney is her getting a call, you know, kind of setting up that the and then it's oh I know who you are I have caller ID jackass uh, and I thought that was really funny. <laughs> yeah, that happened. That happened a couple of times, like like the homage to the the phone calls, like. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe later on, you might bring this up later on, but the Jamie Kennedy, like, right before he's killed, he's on the phone, and he's like, so what scary movies do you like? I'm like, oh, that's literally from the first movie. <laughs> well, and I mean, the tagline for, for Scream, you know, is what's your favorite scary movie? Um, yeah. There, there's just so big. <laughs> yeah, there's just something I love about those slasher movies that, like, they weren't trying to make something iconic. They just just did you know yeah 
the worst like I know I studied film in college and these are probably on the list of worst films ever made from like a critic's standpoint but I think they're some of the best films ever made because they didn't take themselves seriously and it wasn't quote quote about the art it was just hey I have money I have this idea which movie they're stabbing people. oh these the franchise you know? uh, I would say I would say the most people would agree like these are some of the better you know um movies at the very least these are probably the most critically successful slasher films uh you know like look at Friday the 13th I think the highest one there's probably in the high 50s um cuz they're they were trashy movies and they knew they were trashy movies yeah but yeah I, that's interesting I'd like to look into that I know at least the first one like that guy a wonderful review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see so where were we if Campbell uh, uh, Sarah's favorite saint scene the singing scene uh, I really wanted to fast forward uh, okay. it is cheesy again comedic relief or just like not even comedic relief it was just a relief from all the stuff happening you know? and, you and know, it is a movie reference I think it's it's sweet. A movie reference. Well, according to the movie, it is a reference to Top Gun. Oh, I didn't get that. Then again, I've not seen Top Gun in a while. Neither have I. I've never seen it, so. But What's when he movie? first starts... Oh, I... Some, it's gotta be something I love you. Uh, but right before he okay. starts singing, one of... Uh, I think Timothy Olympian's character uh, says it's a Top Gun song. Um, I'm gonna Google this. Okay. So the other thing. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying I'm googling this just because I'm interested in what it the reference is. The other thing with with Sydney before we move on to some of the other characters is the the thing I like with her character and we build on this with three is that she clearly has PTSD from the first movie's events. Oh yeah. And we've never, at least to my knowledge. In a big horror franchise like this, A, we don't usually bring back the final girl. Like, it's always new set of characters, but the same killer. We've never really explored, I think, what the effects of being in a horror film would do to a person. Uh, so it's it's kind of cool with this one, and to a smaller degree, three, which we're going to get to soon. Exploring the, like, this character has PTSD because some lunatic tried to fucking murder her. <laughs> yeah and didn't she technically have some ptsd in the first one too because wasn't her mother murdered her mother was murdered but she didn't they're vague on how much she witnessed but she did fit like accuse the wrong me um because i remember because i don't know like i was having flashbacks to the first film when she was having like ptsd episodes and it kind of reminded me of the first film when mm. she was running away towards the end of the film from, you know, the original murderer. Mm. Just kind of, it kind of gave me vibes from that scene. Anytime okay. she did have flashbacks. So I kind of tied that into like her mother being murdered. She's, she's never really gotten over that, <laughs> you know, like nobody would. Well, nobody and Scream... Her. Scream 3 muddles that whole thing too. Uh, oh, well, the ending of the ending of Scream 3 is a mistake. Um Yeah. So switching gears a little bit to another character, Jamie Kennedy's character, who's also named Jamie in this movie. And I am convinced that they only named him Jamie so they could have the meta joke in the first movie where he's watching Halloween. And yelling at Jamie to run away from the killer while the killer is approaching him. And I love that joke, but I'm convinced that's the only reason his character's name is Jamie. Um, oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. I got that mixed up. His character's name is Randy, but they do the meta joke with the uh, run Jamie because his name is Jamie Kennedy. So I love Randy. He's one of my favorite characters in the first movie. And I like him a lot here, too. Uh, we get the mandatory, like, these are the rules of sequels. Like, we got the, these are the rules of, of horror films. 
And you kind of wish they hadn't killed him in this one. Yeah. I, I really like, I like Jamie Kennedy as an actor. I think he's really, really good. Um, I was kind of, I'm, that was the only character in this film that I was kind of sad for, just because, like, he seemed to, other than Sydney, like, he had a, a fight in the story, you know, like, he was in the house in the first film, and witnessed that, knew the people who were responsible for that, and in this one, like, he really wanted to find the person, and then the person kills him. Mm -hmm. It made me angry. Yeah, but I do like that he, and I, I, what I do like about his death scene, even though it does bum me out because I did like him, is it's kind of like almost a hint that the killer has something to do with Billy because he doesn't get killed until he starts bad mouthing Billy, and then you reveal who the killer is, and it's like, oh, of course, you know, any mother, especially a psychopath, is gonna kill you for insulting your son. The mommy boy reference. That's what did it. Yeah, there you go. Um, but I love that whole scene in the park. You know, he's talking to the killer and, like, Gail and um, Dewey uh, are, like, trying to find the killer. And the way it's shot, and it's just, it's got a good sense of tension, which is something that I think this movie does really well. And then ends in, like, oh, I'm sad because Randy's dead. But he is in Scream 3 for a cameo. So at least there's that to look forward to good i i'm go not gonna lie i don't like it when they do that and the character's dead <laughs> well like, it makes sense in three because it, the cameo i'm just gonna spoil this a little bit for you it's a videotape so it's uh, not okay. really him okay that i'm not mad about that then <laughs> <laughs> uh so cotton weary who is leaf schreiber's character um uh, is such a douchebag in this movie. Almost to a comical point. It's that name. His name <laughs> makes him that way. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> but of course, I would add that way too if my name was Cotton. Like, come on now. <laughs> so dumb. I know, right? It's... I'm getting mad about the wrong things, but... Yeah, that's such a weird thing to be mad about. <laughs> It's okay. I pick the weird things in films to be mad about. Um, so, um, with a lot of this movie being the investigative parts that we mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of this movie is, you know, Dewey and Gale teaming up. I really like that scene, we talked about this a little bit, with the audio booth, where, like, mm -hmm. that one's on this side and the other's on this side, and you can kind of see, like, Ghostface behind them. And then he, he, hurt, he injures Dewey. And I've always felt like these movies tease the idea of killing one of them. Like, that would be a big impact because everybody thinks of them as, like, the secondary protagonist. But then they never quite do. Do you think that would have been better if they just said, fuck it, we'll just, just kill him? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen three through the new one. Is the new one just called Scream? Yes. Okay. So I haven't seen any of the ones after three, but I do have, I do have a problem when films refuse to kill off characters. Like, I understand Dewey is beloved and David Arquette is an actor in the 90s that was in everything pretty much, but it would have been nice to see one of them die just to kind of solidify the fact that this person is crazy and they don't really you know, they don't care. Mm -hmm. They're going after anybody, you know? And no, he just I feel like if any normal person went through the things he went through, because wasn't he shot in the first one? Like multiple He's beat times. up pretty badly in that in the first one. That's why he's limping in this yeah. one. I again I don't see why he would survive being stabbed multiple times. <laughs> it just it, it yes, I get it's very cheesy and it's a campy type of film, but campy films also kill off their main characters. And I think we should we should see that and hopefully in the new one that they do. So I feel see. like with this new one, I because I've been staying away from all trailers and everything. 
I think anything is possible with this one. Because I have heard it is going to be a pa- kind of a passing of the torch film. Um, which doesn't surprise me because, like, how many times can somebody dress up in this costume and go after the same person? Yeah. Uh, like, three. If it's not Sydney or Shining, please kill Dewey. <laughs> yeah, like, kill Dewey or, or kill um, Gale. Like, mm-hmm. I, I would legitimately be upset if we do kill Sydney. Yeah. But if the movie can do it in a believable way, I think I'd be fine with it. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I have that frustration with, like, Jason Voorhees as well. Like, that weird relationship with his sister, yet he wants to kill her at the same time. His sister, You're, that's, right? that's Michael Myers. Michael Myers. I'm getting them confused. Sorry. So, <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. This is almost in a second. The Halloween franchise is fucked beyond belief. Yeah. They are no... No, that's is Jason. That that's Jason. Okay. <laughs> and that, that movie is a lot of fun. I don't know if you would like it, but it's the perfect kind of like stupid for me. Um, but <laughs> so, J- so Michael and Lori start out as sisters and in two. And that was just because John Carpenter didn't care. He didn't really want to make a sequel to Halloween. But then in 2018, they are no longer siblings. Because none of that stuff happened. Halloween has like three, like, we're just going to do fresh start. Like, we're we're going to wipe away the other sequels. And we're going to try again. Okay. Well, I guess that wasn't a good example. But I really have a problem with franchises that do things like that. TV shows, movies, I don't know. It's just like, I call it tension exhaustion. Because you get so tense over these characters, yet they keep coming back, because nobody dies. And it's like, what other scenario can you put them in? Yeah, Who exactly. else is going to come out of, out of the woodwork to come kill them? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> you'd have more creative expression killing your main characters than you would figuring out a way to potentially kill them later on. Mm-hmm. Um, so speaking of, of Jason and Michael and, and killers for the last bit of this review, we're going to talk about the killers in this movie. Um, I love Timothy Olymphant. I don't know how you actually say that last name. Uh, but I love him as an actor, like everything that I've seen him in, he's great. Uh, if, if you haven't seen it, there's a 2010 horror film called the crazies which is a remake of a George Romero film that he stars in, and it's really good. Uh, and then, of course, Santa Clarita Diet, which we're both fans of. Uh, still mad. Still mad that it got canceled. How did you feel about him in this movie? Um, again, these characters are very stereotypical and predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if he did it on purpose or if that's how the character was written. Um, I'd like to go back and see if I can find the script to this film, because something I like to do, especially if it's like a sequel or a remake, I like to read the script to see what type of direction the character is written in, to see the differences between how it was portrayed on screen and how it was written originally. I just feel like he was a more exaggerated and over-the-top version of the last two killers, which I think was the point, but... I don't know. He seemed very over the top all the time. <laughs> yeah, he's got this thing from scene one with him. It's like there's something not right with this guy. He's crazy. Like he is certifiably crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, he he doesn't hide it. And you know, for the people who thought maybe he was the killer in the beginning, rightfully so, because. <laughs> If he's not the killer, then somebody more psycho is the killer, and I have not seen that. It's hard so, to upstage that. So I do agree with you, um, and I, I never put this together until this viewing and kind of talking with you about it as you were watching it. He is very much the, this is the sequel version of Stu from the first movie. Mm-hmm. And as, But as much as I love Timothy Olyphant, he is no Matthew Lillard. Mm-hmm. And, and Matthew Lillard in that first movie is also fucking crazy but it's also like 
you could just you could also buy that it's just oh you know this guy's a little like nuts but not crazy enough to kill someone whereas oh, yeah whereas timothy olip from c1 is like this guy could kill someone yeah he would kill somebody in broad daylight in the middle of the quad at school without a mask on and he wouldn't even care it wouldn't face him <laughs> he would just go for it and you would be like yep that's what i predicted what i do love though with the the, the main killer reveal uh is with it being the mother that goes all the way back to the 60s with psycho of course and then you've got you know friday the 13th which is the inverse of psycho um a lot of the a lot of horror movie monsters it starts with the mom oh yeah it's a psychological thing <laughs> that you know studying psychology um these people don't have that motherly nature take care of them they're lacking mm. that they fixate on ways to hurt people i guess because they're hurting mm -hmm. so it's very yeah very psychological and i, I like think that. and i think it tracks right because with billy in the first movie it was because his dad was sleeping with Bibby's mom it caused a wedge in the, the between his parents marriage and his mom took off so he kills people, and in this one, his mom finds out what happened and decides to get revenge. And I have to commend the lady that's playing um, Mrs. Loomis, because she is really good at both being nuts, but also, like, <laughs> acting sane. Cause have you seen Roseanne? <laughs> no. She's basically that character. She's, what? <laughs> She's in Roseanne? She's in Jackie. Oh, I, I've i never... Oh, okay. I've never watched that show. I'm not killing people, but it's kind of funny to me. But I do like that, like, in my opinion, and I have a different view because obviously I've seen this movie quite a few times. So let me ask you this. If you hadn't known who the killer was and you're just watching this completely blind, would you have ever guessed that it was the random news reporter lady? <laughs> no, because there was that one scene between her and Courtney Cox where she, she makes a comment. I don't remember exactly what she said, but she said something along the lines of being a good person or like having good intentions or something. And it was a, exactly a jab to her, the murderer, but it didn't make sense until the end. But then you look back and you're like, well, it really didn't make sense to begin with because they didn't build her up like they did in the first film, you know, with the two killers. Like mm -hmm. I said previously, they were very much involved in every scene, pretty much. If one wasn't there, then the other was there, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And they're both off screen for big chunks of this film. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. Uh, it didn't bother me as much because I do think it is a fun kind of play on the classic, you know, horror trope. Um, mm -hmm. Mostly, it's a reference to Friday the 13th, really. Because uh, obviously in the first Friday the 13th, it's his mom, not Jason. And if you want to, as much as I love Friday the 13th movies, if you want a really bad whodunit, watch that movie. Because the killer doesn't show up on screen until the last 20 minutes of the movie. There is no way to guess who the killer is in that movie. I understand elements of surprise, but we need to be a little bit more logical about this. Like, <laughs> yes, the person's masked, but at the same time, they still need to have, you know... It, and I get what, like, people like Wes Craven do when they do things like this, because you have, you know, real-life example, serial killers statistically speaking, have more of a tendency to go back to crime scenes and to be involved in search efforts. And I feel like this is a good example cinematically of where they implement that, you know? Like they're in, they're involved in the search efforts, they're involved in the reporting of the crimes. But this one I felt lacked that, minus that like one scene where she is a reporter and she's asking questions and gets yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, okay 
That's it, random, but sure. I think, because this is the longest screen film uh, up until recently. I don't know if the new one is longer or not. But I think what I may, if I could fix this film, not to rewrite the film, because I am not a screenwriter, I would have cut down some of the college stuff and found maybe a way to work them more in. At the very least, you could have worked Timothy Olympus' character more into the, like, script. And then have Mrs. Loomis, the reveal is like she was off-screen mastermind. I'm going to call him Crazy Guy, because I don't remember <laughs> his actual name. <laughs> That's why I'm calling him by the actor's name. <laughs> crazy Guy was also one of those people who just didn't fit. I can't even remember where he came from or like when his first scene was because he was just crazy in every single. Well, scene. his his what first scene. Uh, the, the only reason I mention this because I love this scene, but his first scene is the film class scene. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, crazy doesn't really <laughs> fit, and you're just like, who is this dude? <laughs> oh, God, Although I, there might be an argument to be made that that there's a reason for that. Like, he's not around a lot because he doesn't fit in, and that's what allows, you know, Mrs. Loomis to kind of manipulate him into doing... And I don't know if they did this in the first film, but again, building off of what you were talking about fixing, like, updating the film, like, enhancing, they should have shown some, like, masked scenes of him working or, like being influenced by Ghostface or the person or you know what I mean like implementing things that would suggest he is involved somehow maybe even the killer and build up to that you mean Timothy Olympus character yeah well but the problem with doing that that. is that he doesn't have a connection to him no but I feel like they could with as long as this film is and with the the lack of making connections to kind of build up to who did it it could have made it a plot twist like oh this person fixated on these crimes and they know this person because they you know they're weirdos and stalked the news and so oh i'm going to befriend sydney because she's at my school you know making something so simple and putting a twist on it like that is I felt like the reveal would have been a lot more like, oh gosh, like I didn't expect that. Instead of like, this is kind of dumb because they didn't build up to this and it just kind of happened. (laughs) See, I I don't see, I I know what you mean and I I don't disagree, but what I would do instead is because I like that he is just there because he wants to be on TV. Like he has no other motive than he wants to be famous. I would have had a way to work Mrs. Loomis into the investigation, like some way of, because obviously it, it's it makes sense when you realize, oh, you know, of course, if you're going to do a sequel, it's related to the incident from the first movie. His mom is out there, but nobody mentions Billy Loomis's mom until the end of the movie, and it's also weird. I just thought of this. It's also weird because in the first movie, Gail Weathers uh, knows who Sidney Prescott is because she covered the trial of Sidney's mom's murder very closely. But she doesn't recognize Billy Loomis's mom. And they have that line about like that she lost some weight and stuff like that. But Sidney knows who it is immediately. Is she in the first movie? No. Like that character? Uh-huh. Um, I didn't make that connection. Yeah, that, again, another stupid, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Where did this come from? Okay. I, I will say, <laughs> I like this movie still, but it definitely buckles a little bit under its ambition. Like, it's maybe trying to do too much. Do you know if there's, like, a director's cut? Because I feel like it, with it being so long, it could have potentially, a lot of it hit the cutting, you know, the editing floor. And there's a lot I, of things I know there are some films like that. The only one of these that I know has a different cut is the first film. But the different cut is just like extended kill scenes. Oh, well. That's the 
<laughs> and it's like really hard to find. Unless the 4K has it. Yeah, doesn't make sense. I Yeah, I still feel like the the obsession with the with the crime scenes and the 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 murder trial and all that could have been worked in a lot better. It would have made more sense if she was involved yeah. a lot more. Well, um is there anything else you would like to cover with Scream 2? I do appreciate the what what is it breaking the fourth wall that they kind of do with the film in a film. Yeah, Me- meta self aware. Yeah, I I like I really appreciate that. It's cheeky. I like it. Well, that's what made that first one uh, so popular. So as you know uh, from the last time you were here, when we end a review, we always give it a score on five. It's very arbitrary, but it's just a way to you know kind of summarize your feelings into a number. Uh, so I'm going to stick with my letterbox score for this. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. It's not. It's a step down from the first one, but I think there's a lot of good stuff here. It's a very enjoyable slasher. The Who Done It is a little underbaked compared to the first film, I think, but that doesn't hurt the movie enough for me to call it bad. Overall, it's it's a sequel. It's just pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, for a sequel, normally I don't like sequels. I think they're just kind of banking on the the success of the first one. Um, so I'm not big on sequels a lot of the time unless they're really good. I felt this one was actually pretty well done, despite the fact that it had such a quick turnaround um, compared to the release. And you can definitely tell the budget was a lot better. And I agree with their score. You said a 3.5 out of 5. I would give it that, too. Because the first one, I don't know. I have a special place in my heart for the first one. I can't. I think the first one is... I think the first one is almost a perfect film. Oh, yeah. It's it's easily my favorite one. And that's over any Bruce Campbell film. And I hate to say that, but... (laughs) Really? The first Scream is your favorite film? In the genre, yeah. Interesting. For sure. I, and I think it's because I have that millennial connection to it. It was such a pivotal part of my childhood. And I felt like it was one of the few things in that genre I was able to watch as a kid. Because really, if you think about it, while it's graphic, it's not it's, it's not that bad, graphic-wise. Like, it's, it's rated R or whatever because of language and blood. But that's really all you get. Well, we are out of time for this one. Thank you again for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know if I said this at the beginning, but me and Sarah are going to be doing a lot more videos together. Uh, We've got a lot of different projects in the works. Uh, This was kind of like our test run of just me and you doing doing a video together. And I think it went really well. Uh, So we're going to sign off for right now, but we will be back. We're going to do Scream 3 sometime this week. And then I've got a few ideas for future projects. Uh, I might I might pick a movie that you've never seen so that I could show it to you and then we can have a, like a little bit of a discussion to see what you thought of it. Uh, and there's a lot that I've not seen. So Yeah, we're gonna put her we're gonna put her on blast and make her make her talk about a movie she's never seen before. Uh I just gotta figure out which one. <laughs> but yeah, uh thank you guys for watching and we will be back soon with another video. Peace out.